All right. Welcome to our second attempt to talk about the Enneagram. So each week when we get started, um, I want to do, again, a little bit kind of a, a way of talking about this from a biblical perspective, because I, like I said last week, I think that helps us ground it, because, you're, because you might think, well, what does this have to do with the way things are revealed in Scripture? And so I want to bring up 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me read a few verses, and I'll tell you how I think this applies. Here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 14, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason, any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. So Paul talks here about spiritual gifts. And he's making the point that the whole of the body of Christ needs all the spiritual giftedness. And he's saying this in a context where some Corinthians really wanted certain spiritual gifts and and maybe they were dissatisfied with kind of their own giftedness, like, oh, I just wish I had that gift. And one of the things that we want to emphasize in looking at the Enneagram is that all nine personality types are wonderful. There's no reason to say, oh, I wish I had a different personality type. No. Each one of the personality types is what we call a part of the face of God. The way that we are in our personality can very much express some aspect of the fullness of God. Now, you might be thinking, and I like to anticipate objections, right? Yeah, yeah but Paul's talking about spiritual gifts, and you guys said that our personalities is something that we kind of subconsciously adopted early in life as a way to navigate difficulties. So isn't that a difference? But what I would respond to that objection is, but I think all of the ways that we could possibly choose to navigate life, basically choosing for ourselves, not, not cognitively, not rationally, but just through life, the way that we choose for ourselves how to do that is all within what God deems to be good. Right? In other words, you could say, well, God has created all nine possibilities, and he leaves it up to us how we navigate that and what we end up being. So no, it's not like a spiritual gift bestowed upon us, and yet it is no less, I think, the way God ordains us to live. Mm -hmm. And of course, Paul's point is, and there's something beautiful when all of the parts are functioning together. That's the idea. So as we talk about this, and especially as, as Wesley is going to do an overview of all nine um, personality types, don't be in the mode of thinking, oh, but I just wish I, I could be that other type. That sounds so much better. Mm. Nah. I think like Paul is saying, but God has designed things the way he has and somehow live and flourish where you have found yourself to be mm -hmm. because that's the will of God for you. Yeah. All right. Man, it just kind of piggyback on that as a transition in, into this, I guess the question is, how do I embody the reality of God? How do I embody the divine reality? And I think that's a, a wonderful way to look at it and to kind of bring it into some perspective there. So I got, first of all, we want to leave it open for a little bit. Uh, we said a lot last week. So is there is there any pressing questions that's kind of on the forefront of your mind that you want to kind of dissect a little bit before we get into even more um, material on the, the nine types. Is there anything that's coming to your mind that you want to... Daryl. Yeah, my assumption is that you, you basically develop a type and you kind of stay within that type of the, whatever that is in your mind. There's no like, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to willfully go from two 
right? Yeah, there's no willful. Yeah. 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 Last week I wasn't sure what you were Mm -hmm. I want to just make sure that was the case because you, okay. whatever yeah. you were born with or the, the way you developed, that's the way you would be probably for the rest of your life. Yeah, so but, but the healthier version of that. Right, but that's but the thing is, this is not behavior based. It is motivation. It's what moves you. That's true. You can do what is the behavior. You know, you could say, well, twos are very helpful, and I'm a I'm a six, but I want to do helpful things. Nothing's barring you. Having a six personality does not keep you from being uh -huh. a very helpful person, right? Mm -hmm. Because this, this is not, it's not predictive of your behavior. It's just how you tend to be motivated, mm -hmm. and that can have its strengths and its weaknesses. But the whole range of possibilities in terms of how you want to engage in the world are open to you, mm -hmm. right? So you say, nine's a peacemaker, and I'm a seven. Well, be a peacemaker, you know. <laughs> you can be a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. You're not barred from being uh -huh. a peacemaker. It just may not be kind of the the core way you look at things or the motivation that you kind of by default bring to things. But anyone can be a peacemaker. So in some sense, in some sense, yes, you, you're you not, this is not about, well, you're stuck here and your, re your options are limited. We're, that's not what this is communicating. This is saying, this is what you need to to understand about yourself, self-awareness. Uh -huh. It's a tool, but you can you can live out any number of ways of actually living, behaving, blessing others in the world. You're not restricted by this. I have a question. Yeah, Kobe? I've always thought of it as something you were basically born with, and I'm hearing y'all say that it should be something that you in early life to deal with problems. That, that's the theory, mm -hmm. and and I have no better one. But that's... It that's doesn't matter. We all kind of got yeah, we yeah. are where we are, how yeah. we got there. Yeah. But it is kind of suggested. Like, I look at my granddaughter. I'm not sure she has a motivation yet that she's developed about how she's going to navigate life. I have a son that was clearly an eight when he was this tall. Yeah. So I don't know. Was he one when he developed it, or six months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or what? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike. Mike. Um, I've heard some trained counselors say that they believe that we are either born with or very clearly at the birth age. We're born with about forty percent of the tools that human beings, and then the rest of us learn afterwards. But um, that's learned, but for me, I used to be very, very introverted, and I was talked into taking a job from Wall Street, and um, on phone call, they talk to people, and I became more of an outgoing person just because I allowed myself to take on an extra team. Exactly. Yep. But you can't change. Right. You won't maybe change your basic kind of orientation, but again, you can change how you uh, how you do things. So I thought that this was uh, my Enneagram thought for uh, yesterday. I'm a five. Remember that unhealthy fives are reclusive, nihilistic, and become obsessed with distorted interpretations of reality. Do not act out these self-defeating reactions now or ever. <laughs> Right. See, this is self-awareness. Uh -huh. It's not saying you will be that way. Mm -hmm. It's saying you have a tendency to do these things, and the very self-awareness of this tool is, and you don't have to do that. Uh -huh. If you're aware of it, now you know, hey, I can make other choices. Mm -hmm. When I'm not aware of it, I tend to fall into the same things and can't figure out why I keep doing that, right? Right. <laughs> So this is why self-awareness is most of the struggle. Ignorance is our enemy. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is our friend. Yeah. Knowledge can open up. Okay, so I tend to do that. I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. That's free, right? Yeah. 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 This is telling me I'm not stuck, mm -hmm. but I need to be aware of what I could fall into if I'm doing it, if I'm just doing things in an unreflective way and kind of following the easy path. I could become reclusive, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you're saying, Michael. You just intentionally took on something that might not have been so much natural to you, but you can learn to do it, right? Okay, someone else had a hand. Speak up if you had a hand up. No hand? No hand. All right. All right. All right, we'll, we'll, push on, we'll, we'll push on here. So uh, just to remind you about the chart and the different numbers here, we're gonna go through this, but this is what it looks like, this, this Enneagram chart. So I wanna talk about something called a triad. And so what it is, you no, know, there's nine points here. A triad represents a, a group of three that is connected to kind of where our, our experiences kind of are, are rested in. So. If you're a nine, there's there's a gut component of your experience of reality. So you 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 get a gut feeling for whatever reason, or your gut is unsettled because you want to be a peacemaker. This is uh, this is the orientation of of a nine, for for instance. And then we have a heart or feeling triad, which is two through four. Uh, the, this is the, the the emotional side of the experiences of, of the enneagram. And then we have the head. Greg is a five, so <laughs> right. So this is the you're, you're resting on your thinking and your thoughts and your, your mind, right? So we all have elements of this, right? I'm not just my gut, right? I think and I I feel, but I rest in in my, my gut, or you might rest in your heart, or you might rest in your mind. Does that make sense? That's kind of an overview overview of this idea. So I, I, I'm going to go in and kind of. Uh, dissect this, but this is a good uh, synopsis of it. The triads, the triads are a sub subvision of the Enneagram system based on the way each type relates to reality through different, uh, di three diff diff differential centers, head, heart, and gut. These are the different ways that human beings perceive their experiences and their dominant emotions such as shame, fear, and anger. Wesley's muted on Zoom. Oh. Wesley's muted? Um... They, I'm, I'm not attached anywhere. So if I'm muted, everybody's muted. Oh. Is that Just muted? Okay. Oh. Hey, Craig? Yeah. Yeah, John? You having trouble hearing Wesley or everyone? I can't hear you if you can hear me. Well, no, that's strange. Uh-oh. Okay, well, I'm switching to, I'm just going to use my computer mic. Can you hear me now, John? Now we can't hear him. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, can you please be able to say that although we have dominant areas, uh -huh. we're actually a blend of all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly what I just said. Like, you're not just your gut or your mind or your heart, but there's there's maybe a posture that you kind of rest on. So I'm, I'm using my mind and my, my, my heart and my emotions and my feelings, but I, I rest in my gut for whatever reason. I, just okay, keep going. just keep they going. To, they may have to just get the recording if it's not going live. I don't know why. Okay. And each triad has like a, a dominant emotion that's kind of attached to. So... For the, the nine area, the, the, the gut, it is anger. For whatever reason, there's an anger attached to the gut and the body. So the nines, uh, the, the different Enneagrams on, on this, is what are you doing with your anger? Are, are you compliant? Are you just trying to be peaceful and, and not deal with some things you need to deal with? Are you suppressing your anger? And this is the, the posture of the nine, right? So every single number is going to do different with, with whatever triad is kind of resting on. So it's, it's, uh, it's um, shame here and it's fear here. So, so every, every triad has a, a center but also has an emotion kind of attached to that. Any, any thoughts on that, Greg? Any thoughts on, on this? I mean, one of the things I think of the, the self-awareness part is if I realize that I tend to live in my head, then it's a... It's a, it's helping me realize. Pay more attention to my intuition, my gut. Uh -huh. Pay more attention to my feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. That's where the self awareness could be. I de-emphasize those, so I need to learn to 
ask myself, what are what is my intuition telling me? Not just think, but wonder what my intuition is telling me. Right. And so, I, again, it's not limiting. It's not saying you're stuck here. It's just saying you tend to dominate from this sphere, but you can learn to, as we grow healthier and, and more mature in our own personality, we can learn to also rely on those other parts. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, again, it's not limiting us. Yeah. I would say rely on those other parts and also just acknowledge where you rest at. Because I've, I've dis just acknowledge where my resting place is. I've ignored my gut in a lot of ways. And I think there's, there are psychological and like physical, maybe medicinal connections to some of this stuff. I'm not even saying that right. The word is not coming to my mind. I'm trying to think of the word. Okay, for, for instance, I, I denied my gut for a little bit and then I got into this situation where we were clearly were not in the right place. <laughs> we were not supposed to be in, in this situation that we're in, me and my wife. And my gut was telling me that, and I ended up getting IBS. <laughs> I, I acquired IBS because I was denying my gut feeling, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think my body was trying to tell me, leave, run. But I was denying that. And I think eventually, because I was denying that, I developed something like IBS. So who knows? Perhaps someone that is kind of resting in their head maybe they can be more inclined to be mentally, I don't know, anxiety, de- dealing with different mental illnesses. I mean, th- there might be a, a point there that we can, we can dive into. But like I said, you can see some, some, some headaches. Oh, you can say headaches, right? Or uh, anxiousness, maybe some anxiety resting in your heart, maybe. Yes, yeah, is that physiological? Yeah, phys- yeah, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Right? It wasn't coming to me. Yeah, so there's, I have a book called The Anatomy of the Spirit in my, my office right now. And she kind of, she doesn't use the Enneagram, but she touches on some of these things. She, she argues that our sicknesses have emotional and mental roots. So if I'm denying what my gut is trying to tell me, my body is going to find a way to let me know, you know what I'm ignoring. So The Anatomy of the Spirit speaks to that. Wesley, is there, I'm sort of, everybody probably all knows this but me. But we're talking about dominant emotions here with each of the, the, the triads. I mean, in my mind, and maybe it's just me not being really aware or wanting to be aware or acknowledging, I don't consider myself an angry person. Or, I don't either. <laughs> okay, or a fearful person or yeah. a person who feels shame or anxiety. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm just like, I'm like, I'm just, per- I'm ignoring all that. Because if these are dominant emotions for each of the three, I know I got to be all of those or some of those. <laughs> so why am I unaware that I'm not particularly an angry person or a fearful person or a person who feels shame? And maybe I should. Okay. I, I, are those, I, the, are I, those healthy things or unhealthy? No. I, I think again, this is this is for self awareness. So I fall into the into the five, and that's if I have a problem, I'm going to tend to be more fearful. Now, that doesn't mean I'm living as a fearful person. Okay. But you know what? Most of the time, I don't feel guilty. Mm. You know, like the shame of feeling guilty? No, I don't tend mm. to feel that way. I know other people who are really more racked by guilt. I only feel pretty, well, I was right. You know, I mean, that's just my <laughs> default. <laughs> now, now, if, if I'm going to feel bad, if I'm going to feel bad, it's going to be like, oh, I'm afraid of what could happen. Or, I'm, af-, you know, mm. if I'm going to have a negative thing, it's going to be more fear, then it's going to be shame. Right or anger, I can tend to you always know, stay most of the time pretty even keel. Doesn't doesn't make me angry, mm. but if I have a problem, okay. it's going to tend to be in the fear category. Afraid about the future, afraid about what someone, or in my case, afraid of being incompetent. Mm. That's why I chose the strategy of trying to know everything and learn everything mm. as a child was that would stave off my fear of being incapable mm. or incompetent or unable. Right. So my childhood strategy was just learn more and then you won't ever be incompetent. And what are you afraid of? Being incompetent. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> Man. You know, does that make sense? Yes. So it just doesn't mean you're a fearful person. It just means if you struggle, that could be what will crop up for you and why it doesn't crop up for someone else. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, why don't they feel like I feel? Well, they may be coming from a different place. That makes sense. Yes. So Wesley, uh, <clears throat> I think I think I got this right then. So gut is anger, head is fear, so heart is 
I'm sorry. This is probably not. It's probably not like yeah. matching up. So you, you got to do the matching yourself. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Does not mean it's just those three that's things. right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yep. That's the idea. Any questions on this? Now we're going to zoom in on each part to talk about the individual numbers that are attached to each triad. Any questions? Okay. All right. So the first zoom here, we got the eight, the nine, and the one. Okay. The eight is called the challenger. This is the person that's the powerful dominating force in most conversations or um, just in social situations. They're usually self-confident, decisive, willful, and confrontational. This is usually the posture, the, the outside behaviors or, uh, of the, the eight, and maybe even some, some um, inner motivations that they may, um, they may be experiencing. Um, so I'm going to go through each one of them, and then if you guys have, uh, if you identify with one of these numbers, maybe you can add some more commentary on this. Hey, and can I make an observation? When yeah. I was looking at these descriptions, it seems to me with each one, there's four terms. The first two have to do with what this person can do in an outstanding way and maybe the second two mm. are the less healthy yep right yeah and it's going to be that way for all of them so when it'll say something about you that you're like oh but i don't like that i because it's admitting you're great at this but you can struggle with that uh-huh okay. so so and this is still super 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 you know an overview it's just four terms uh -huh. they're giving you kind of two words to describe it and then four terms two of the strengths Two of the struggles. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's still very, very cursory. Uh-huh. Go ahead. So the nine is the peacemaker, the easygoing, self-effacing. Yep. Uh, receptive, reassuring, agreeable. But this is the problem right here, complacent. Yeah. <laughs> complacent. And sometimes it's not good to be agreeable all the time. There's going to be some times where you have to s say some things. You just can't be quiet. There, you have to be able to... Be confrontive in some ways. There's, there's going to be a time for that, right? Then the one, the reformer, the rational, idealistic type, principled, purposeful, self-controlled, and perfectionist. So if you tend to identify with one of these numbers, you want to offer some more commentary on a particular number. Yes. yes. I think it's interesting that um, you said that that triad has anger. Yes. Is uh -huh. That the peacemaker would have that Passive aggression. Uh huh. That's my love language. Wow. Uh -huh. uh, I think a lot of times that anger can come from um, another triad uh -huh. part of you. Yeah. 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 And, and it doesn't mean that anyone around you sees the anger. Just like anyone around me might not see my fear, but internally, there's things I can be afraid of, mm. right? So it, again, it's not that you're, we're not talking behavior. Well, that's an angry person. No, you know, it's, it's just like with the reformer, they like things to follow principle. They tend to get angry when things are not following the rules and following the way it should be, mm -hmm. right? Now, they may not express that outwardly, but inwardly they're like, oh, why isn't that going according to the way it should go? Mm -hmm. They get upset with that. Right? But it could, may be totally internal. No one else ever sees. Or you might not see it, but the yeah, right, yeah. perceptive yeah. does. This um, is true. In your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I, for the one, I think there is a, typically a really strong inner critic. Mm -hmm. There's that voice that's sort of driving your behaviors, and usually the inner critic is judging other people's behaviors, too. That's right. More than anything, it's judging your, your behavior. Yeah. yeah. You can't live up to the ideals that yeah. you have. Yeah. Right, and you're always beating yourself up for falling short. Yeah, if that sounds like you, you could be a one, yeah. right? And that's just, and what we're saying is, it's just a struggle you might have. So one of the things is learn to be more gentle with yourself. Mm. You know, don't demand that yourself be perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay to not be perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, and as an eight, one of those I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> an issue of not wanting to be controlled mm. yeah. it's 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 almost it's for me anyway speaking for myself it's 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 i'm willful and and 
confrontational oftentimes because I fear being controlled. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in order to not be controlled, that's my stance. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say I've taken the, the full test, and my two is actually one point higher than an eight. And so I'm willful and confrontational, but I really want you to still like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to be helpful, but I want you to do it my way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Man. Yeah. I mean, I have some <laughs> start looking at that unhealthy going, okay, I'm leaning a little too far to that side, but I need to lean closer to the healthy eight. Because um, right. healthy eights are your quote unquote natural leaders. Mm -hmm. They can take charge. They can get things done. They can be decisive. They're not like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> An eight charts a course and we go. See, we need eights uh -huh. in the body. We need eights in the world, That's right? right. Uh -huh. yeah. That's the whole point is to, to realize it's good to be whatever I am uh -huh. and I have so much to offer. That's right. Right. Stress, I go to five, and then, yeah, I yeah. will... I will we're we're going to get to those uh -huh. relationships, yeah. 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 But, yeah, you, you're not just your number. You're also, you have an affinity to both the numbers on either side of you, mm -hmm. and there's two other numbers that you can, that are very closely tied to you. So, you're one number, there's eight more. For those other eight, you're also tied to very closely. That's why this is not a simple... You're this or that. Uh -huh. No, you're complex, and to understand yourself well is to understand the complexities of all these interactions, right? If you look up your um, famous counterpart, I don't like any of them. <laughs> 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 Dictator. Oh. <laughs> I don't like all of them. Yeah. yeah. They're, those are the unhealthy eight. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Should we move on to the next triad? Yeah. Okay. The next one is the heart or feeling, and here you have two, the helper, the caring, interpersonal type, demonstrative, generous, people-pleasing, and possessive. So the, the people-pleasing, possessive is on the negative side, yeah, right? Generous, uh -huh. helpful is the good side. Yeah. But, but people-pleasing could be a problem. Yeah. Trying to make everyone happy, yeah. right? And demonstrative, how, that's helpful? What does that mean, the demonstrative part? They is, show their affection. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They demonstrate it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like you're just way too demonstrative. Right? No, no. I thought, See, it, was I thought it was a negative thing. Uh, yeah. No. And I saw on Facebook this word I saw people pleasing is not one of the fruits of the spirit. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man. Oh, yeah. 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 Act of service is a big one for people. Uh -huh. yeah. Act of service. Yeah. yeah. And on that note, I, I read in Alice Frying's book, Mirror of the Soul, she says we tend to the church tends to raise women that are leaning towards the two, oh. right? So sometimes you may take a test and maybe this is what you want, right? But it, maybe this is not what you're, you're motivated by or driven by, right? Maybe this is the outside behavioral parts of your reality. Yeah. Okay. So the three is the, the achiever, the success-oriented, pragmatic type, adaptive, ex excelling, driven, and image conscious. Then four is the individualist, the sensitive, withdrawn type, expressive, dramatic, self-absorbed, and temperamental. Anybody that identify with one of these numbers want to offer some commentary? Yeah, and uh, as far as two goes, when uh, Susan and I initially started learning about the Enneagram, I thought for sure I was a one. She thought I was a one. There was no doubt my behavior seemed to be a one. But when I actually ultimately looked at my motivation, mm -hmm. there was no doubt it was pleasing people. Mm -hmm. And that's what slid me to the two. Mm -hmm. To be honest, my outwardly, you probably never know. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm a three. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Do you think that that might be a three? <laughs> yeah, we need, to, we need to embrace that. That's why yeah. I started with the passage uh -huh. I did. I need to embrace, this is how God wills for me to live out the, his grace and his image uh -huh. in the world, right? This is my calling. This is good. So what Ken right. meant to say is, I'm a two. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a two. 
And that's, that's what you why I organized the firehouse <laughs> exactly. service, and I've done it for years. Uh-huh. That's right. Yeah. Good. Yes. Exactly. Uh-huh. I'm glad he organizes that. Otherwise, it would fall to me, and it would uh-huh. be just another thing I would have to run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, of the, one of the ways we can diagnose ourselves is to look at the one that we hate the most. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, I really don't like that. Right. Because... I like Richard Rohr's thing is positives are like Teflon and negatives are like Velcro. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we read the description, what sticks to us is the negative, yeah. right? And that's why we need to really, we have to work hard and say, yes, there are those negatives, but don't let the positives slip away. Mm-hmm. These positives are essential to the kingdom, to God's work in the world, mm-hmm. to the transformation of uh-huh. all things. I just don't need to focus on what, po- what sticks out to me is the things I don't like. Like one thing I learned about myself was I can be overly sensitive. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. If I look back at my history, I go, yeah, that's me <laughs> to a T. But it's what I'm saying is it's freeing when I realize I can be overly sensitive. Every time I start getting my feelings hurt, what can I tell myself? You're just being overly sensitive. Yeah. And all of a sudden I think, you know, other people wouldn't react this way to this. Mm-hmm. You know, and I start thinking... And I don't have to react this way. It is kind of an easy default, Mm -hmm. but I can go, wait a minute. I know other people, and they would just, they would be okay. Why am I, you know, so I can live into something different simply because I'm aware of what I tend to do. That has freed me from actually having to do it. Right? We've got a couple of hands. Got a hand here. I think in my profession, a lot of us are going to be threes and fours. Mm. It's not because I don't uh, firmly understand what's going on around me. It's because I have my own ideas about things, Uh my own feelings about things, and they are most important to me. Mm. Uh, Those are what are going to come first, and that's the lens through which I will interpret everything. Yes. Um, And as a physician, you know, when I think something is right for somebody, there's very little short of God that's going to convince me. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> that sounds like some great self-awareness. Yeah, I, I love Bob's self-awareness. Exactly. See, when we can read ourselves that carefully and understand ourselves and how we function, that's good. Uh-huh. That's healthy, right? Self-awareness, that's, that's freeing. Yes. And the permission to live into that. There's nothing wrong with me having my personality. Sometimes, like, I, I loved your point about the church is often want all women to be twos mm-hmm. and women who are eights and sevens and ones and, and all, they've often felt very constrained, yeah. right? And out of place. Yeah, yeah, it's like there's no space for you. Yeah. Well, but that's because the church has totally missed the whole point of the, the wonderful complexity that's of the right. way God has made it. That's right? right. So live enthusiastically into who you are uh-huh. and don't let the church say no to that. It's like it's holy. The body, you know? Exactly. Yeah. The eyes can't do what the nose can do. Uh-huh. The hands can do. That's right. right. We need all parts. That's right. right. Exactly. Derek, you had a hand? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I agree with it, everything everybody's saying. At the same time, I think uh, we haven't said yet that I think part of uh, of leaning into your own type and nature is still confronting the, the dark side of it. Mm-hmm. Right. I think most of the good things we do have a motivation that we don't really necessarily want to acknowledge how much control it has over uh-huh. us. So it is liberating also to recognize that and see it. So to pick on the twos, uh, you know, <laughs> you're giving, but part of that is a fear of, it's uh, some of it, a lot of the giving is for you. Mm-hmm. Right to right. get them to not leave you, to, mm. to stay, uh, to stay in relationship, or to be perceived that way, uh, and it's that way for all of all of the types. There's yeah. um, and so recognizing that isn't to, to reject your own type, but you do. I think you get a lot of liberty from re- from seeing. Okay, mm-hmm. am I doing this for that person, or am I doing it for you know for my own relationship with that person myself? And, and then um, you can, 
that way, you can lean into all the other parts of God that are in you. Right. Right. Well said. What, one thing that, well, the reason I said I'm a student in that fashion is, um, that, you know, going back to the old discussion where we talked about there's no such thing as a true motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so I know that I now see that a lot of times when I'm giving, it's in hopes that somebody will notice and give back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark. It, it hurts me more. <laughs> and, and then I've immediately pulled uh, Mark Connell's frequent statement, it's always good to do good. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, so our motives are not entirely accurate. Right. It's still good to do good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I don't have to have pure motivation. Yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, it's impossible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Everything I do, there's always a little bit of it that's all about me. Mm -hmm. I just have to make sure that's just a little bit, and I kind of try and keep, imprison uh -huh. that within a cell and keep, you know, keep it from taking over. Mm -hmm. But if I can only do good when I have pure motivations, I will have never done any good in, well, ever. Like, like uh, the example I give people is, you know, when I'm walking across the parking lot at work and there's paper on the floor on the ground and I bend over and pick it up, throw it in the trash, I'm doing the right thing, but I'm secretly saying, I wish someone would notice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you had a hand? I appreciate what Bob said about the viewing, uh, viewing things through the lens of our own uh, you know, personality types and our uh, characteristics. And I've recently uh, realized that uh, by reflecting on my experiences and sometimes experiences, interactions that I had with God, that I uh, view God in a different way than I do now. I, I'm, and I'm just starting to process that and realize that I've been viewing God through this lens of a characteristic of mine that's not the way God is. Mm. Mm. And I'm just now starting to realize that. I'm thinking, man, this is going to be interesting to see where mm. this goes and kind of what it changed, how it changes my view mm. of, of God. That, I, I love that suggestion. Yeah. I mean, Richard Rohr often says that God is a mirror. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I see in God is what I believe about myself. It's, right. it's a reflection of myself. It's yeah. not really who God is. So I think God is like me. And that's a bad assumption because mm -hmm. I can be judgmental and I can be, you know, vindictive and I can be pleasing. And I, I'll, I'll put all that on God. Yeah. And, you, and you're so right. We all do that to some extent. And it's, it's freeing again to realize, yeah, God has not got my hangups. <laughs> we good for the next triad? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, last one. This is the head or thinking triad, and the seven, the enthusiast, is the busy, fun-loving type, spontaneous, versatile, dist distractible, and scattered. The six is the loyalist, the committed, security-oriented type, engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious. And five is the investigator, the intense, cerebral type, perceptive, the innovative, secretive, and isolated. What are your thoughts on this? Anybody resonate with some of these? And um, that's the one I tend to identify with the most. And the 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 awareness came as I was reading so the through one of the materials I've come across that sort of connected the deadly sins with each of uh -huh. the types. Yep. And sort of that the idea with the five was greed, mm. not from a perspective of more money, but more knowledge. That's right. So knowledge uh -huh. is what, and it is hoarding the knowledge. Yeah. You know, that, and what happens when the five is healthy is they give away the knowledge. That's they right. They become leaders. They become people that unintentionally often other people are following and wasn't what they're looking for. That's right. Greg Newton. Yes. He's a five. He's a thinker. He has knowledge, but he gives it away. I think you're healthy. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> we, we probably will link those to the what are classically called the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. and when you say, well, there's nine, there's seven. Okay, we'll, we'll work that out. Uh-huh, that's right. I really, <laughs> I really like the guy who came up with it, Evagrius of Ponticus in the late 300s. He didn't call them sins because we tend to think sins like you know, commissions of acts. He called them, and he had eight, he called them the eight obsessive thoughts. Yeah. That's way better uh -huh. because it's not really the act. 
it's he, his observation was there's an idea that gets rolling in our head and when we obsess on that idea it can lead to certain acts mm. like for me greediness of of trying to just gather it all in but the obsessive thought is i won't be enough mm. and the future is in danger unless i have enough that's the deadly thought mm. it's that that the the good of the future is is predicated on whether I can gather in enough for it. And so my problem is I just need to trust that God will take care of tomorrow and I don't have to overly be greedy about gathering all these resources for my in my case of knowing things. It's okay not to always have to know the answer to everything, right? So I like that idea. It's an obsessive thought more than like a sinful action. But, but we're familiar with the language, but that's, I think, a good distinction. Because, again, we're saying, are you saying I do that? Like I'm doing something? No, we're just saying there's a, there's a kind of dynamic going on that you tend to go in these directions. Right? Okay. Well, I guess next time we'll get into the arrows. Okay. All right, so that'll be it for today. Uh, we're going to email this to you along with the slides from last week. You'll begin that this week. Uh, any last, last thoughts as we wrap this up? <laughs> Yeah, the slides. Also put the slides on the web page. Yeah, we can have a, a kind of a resource set yeah, where exactly. we can we can have these things we've been looking at. And like the, the books that Wesley shared the first time, uh -huh. we can have all the resources. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. all right, well, let's end with this prayer that I had up last week. And this can be our prayer every week. So pray this with me. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. Thank you for being here.